hello guys and welcome to another episode of my lecture this is Ola Yeni, Dear Colola Daniel, popularly known as Dear Cor Spectre. And on today's episode of Dear Cor Talks Law, we will be talking about the first maxim of equity, which is the fact that equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. This, however, is not my first equity lecture. That is my first lecture on the law of equity. So if you, after this lecture, want to see other videos on the law of equity, you can click the playlist from my channel. Please don't forget to subscribe. Make sure that you subscribe to my channel. Make sure that you also click the notification bell so that anytime I release a lecture video which is going to be of interest to you, you'll be one of the first set of people to watch that lecture video. Now, if you click my playlist, you will be able to find as many Law of Equity lecture videos that you would need during your course of study in the university or for whatever reason that you need Law of Equity for. So for today, we'll be talking about Maxim 1. Equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. Now, if you understand the history of equity in itself, if you understand the history of equity, then you would automatically understand this maxim, which is the fact that equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. Which means that in the society where there is a wrong, there should be a remedy. If there is a wrong, there is no remedy, then it goes against the bane of equity itself. If you remember part of the history, you would understand it was because there were no new writs in the common law courts. And not just that, because the kind of judgment that the common law courts were issuing, they were not enough to cater for the extent of damage that that suit, you know, caused or whatever arose in, in the course of the suit. Do you understand that? Which is the reason people began to take their complaints to the king and then the king delegated the, you know, duty of adjudicating to the Lord Chancellors. Now, so if you can understand that part of the history of equity, then you would understand the fact that equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy. So let us go to the note and from there I'll be explaining parts. Now, this maxim is at the root of all equitable jurisdiction. It should not be interpreted as meaning that every moral wrong was remedied by equity. It means that in certain circumstances where the common law court fail to recognize a right or to provide a remedy for a wrong equity would not stand by and see a party suffer an injustice but would grant a remedy provided that it was suitable for judicial enforcement the oppression of this maxim may be seen in relation to three types of equitable jurisdiction the first is the original jurisdiction the second is the concurrent jurisdiction and then the third is the ancillary jurisdiction i think what we are learning here is the fact that where there is a wrong Equity will step in to give a remedy. However, do not think that it is every wrong that occurs that equity will give a remedy to. Do you understand that? It is not every wrong that equity will step in to give a remedy to. Such wrong has to be that it is for judicial enforcement. So when you're looking at equity, equity is more of a subjective perspective. Do you understand that? Now, you have equity most times is subjective to the judges. When you bring a matter to the court and then you are trying to invoke the equitable jurisdiction of the court, you have to show that there has been a wrong. Not just that, you also have to show that that wrong is such that if there is no remedy, you will suffer a lot of damages. Do you understand that? And then you have to appeal to the equitable conscience of the court. 
Do you understand? Because it has to be the judge that will grant it. So most of the time, when it comes to equity, it's usually subject to the discretion of the judge because the judge has to determine whether or not it is suitable for judicial enforcement. So with that, let us go to the three types of equitable jurisdiction that exist. The first one is the original jurisdiction. Like I've said, and I gave an example of trust. Now, at common law, the trustee was the absolute owner of the trust property and could deal with it as he pleased. The rights of the beneficiary were not recognized. Equity, however, conceiving this to be a wrong, compared the trustee to hold the property for the benefit of the beneficiary, whose right equity enforced not only against the trustee, but against any transferee from him with notice of the trust. Now, what, what does this mean? And that's why I drew a little bit of analogy under. Now, under the common law, if you've watched my other videos i think i've made this explanation before for the purpose of this i'll make the explanation again under the common law where you have a trust property for those who do not understand what a trust is let me use this analogy here now you have the father who is the owner of a particular property who died in 2002 when the son was only old five years old now, according to the laws of most countries, including Nigeria, a five-year-old child cannot hold a property. You need to be 18 in some other countries, 21 in some other countries, to be able to hold property. But for the purpose of this example, let us say the country, you need to be 18. Now, because the father died when the child was only five, in his will, he gave the property to his brother now his brother in this case would be the uncle of the son under the common law the fact that the will gave the brother the property to hold it for the son the son does not have any interest on the property the only person with interest is the uncle that is the brother of the father so, under the common law, when the son is now up to 18 and want to collect the property back from the uncle, most of the time, the uncle would have sold the property and squandered the money. Most of the time, the uncle, you know, would have done so many things to the property that would have made the property even depreciate in value if the property still exists. So, because of this, equity said, no, this is wrong. The owner of this property is not the uncle. The owner of this property is the son. And the fact that the son cannot hold the property does not mean that the son should not have any right on this property whatsoever. So equity then clothed the son with a right known as equitable interest. Whilst the uncle had the legal interest of the property. Do you understand that? This is equity would not suffer a wrong without a remedy. The son here would not suffer a wrong of not being able to hold the property without a remedy. Do you understand that? Now, under the common law, the fact that the uncle has sold the property and squandered the money or has depreciated the property heavily in value, the son has no remedy whatsoever. It is all gone. It is all gone. But under the courts of equity, they say, no, it cannot be all gone. No. It is against good conscience to do that. It is against fairness and it is against justice to do that. So what can we do? Then they devised a way to help the son and then they clothed him with equitable interest. The equitable interest is not only enforceable against the uncle. Which means, when the uncle is about to sell the property, or when the uncle begins to use the property in a way that might depreciate in value, or in a way that is detrimental to the son's interest, the son can go to court and stop the uncle. Something that he couldn't have done if he were under the common law. Not only is that right enforceable against the uncle, the right is also enforceable against third parties who are dealing with the property in a way that is detrimental to the son's interest. 
So much so that when a third party has even bought the property and the third party had knowledge, either actual, implied, or constructive knowledge of the fact that the property is a trust property and the son is the owner of the property, the son's interest will be ranked above that third party because the third party had notice of his own interest. That is how potent this principle is. Do you understand that? But do note that that can only happen when the third party had notice. If the third party didn't have notice that the property belonged to someone else because it was a tr trust property, then the third party is likely to take the property and that other son's interest will be extinguished on the property. Do you understand that? That in itself explains the original jurisdiction of equity. Do you understand that? So now let us go to the next. And what is the next? The next is the concurrent jurisdiction, which is equitable remedies. Now, at common law, the only remedy for a breach of contract was damages. Where this remedy would be insufficient for the plaintiff, e.g. in the case of breach of contract for sale of land, equity would grant what is known as specific performance, thus compelling the defendant to perform the contract. Similarly, where damages would be insufficient redress for a tort, for example, nuisance, equity will grant an injunction to restrain further invasion of the plaintiff's rights. Now, I want you to understand what original jurisdiction is. Original jurisdiction means that there is no concurrent equivalence in, you know, the common law. But when we are talking about concurrent jurisdiction, you are saying that there is a concurrent equivalence, which means that under original jurisdiction, you cannot have anything that is equivalent to equitable interest. I was telling you when I was talking about the trust property that the, the, the son there has equitable interest over the trust property, right? So you don't have an equivalence to that equitable interest. What you have is legal interest and that is what has always been in common law. The legal interest the court of equity was you know the one that you know brought out what is known as the equitable interest but when you come to concurrent jurisdiction now on the same matter on the same matter common law courts can say a and the court of equity can say b because they both have concurrent jurisdiction on that matter so what do i mean by that now, there has been a case of contract, for example, and one party had breached. Now, because of the breach, it has resulted in what? Damages. Now, he lost a lot of things and all that. Now, for some people, for some plaintiff, giving them the money to recoup for the damages would be okay. But for other people, giving them the money might not necessarily be okay. So let me say, for example, they don't want to have a concert at O2 Arena and then the person who is supposed to set up the stage and do everything, who, you know, he had already contracted and all that, paid about 50 million to do all that he had paid and everything because he didn't want any, you know, problem on that day. Now, the day came for one reason or the other, the person wasn't able to come to set up the stage. And you don't need the babalawo to tell you that when the stage is not set up, then that's the end right because you can't have the program now david do now postponed it to the next three months and went to court but when he got to court the court let's say went to common law court the common law court will award him damages now but david do still needs the guy to still set up the stage because he postponed it in the next three months is damages enough that's the question is damages enough no for Davido, it might not be for other people, especially when setting up the stage is so sophisticated that the only person that has that knowledge and can do it perfectly is this person in question. Giving me money for damages will not be enough. It is not a sufficient remedy. I want you to command him to do it because I've paid him. That is specific performance. I want him to perform the terms of the contract. You see, specific performance wasn't something that you could find under the common law.
Common law, any small thing damages. Any small thing damages. This one do damages. But sometimes damages is not enough. For some people, they feel that damages isn't enough. They want the person to perform the terms of the contract. And that is why you have specific performance under the law of equity. Do you understand that? And also, you can also see where I wrote in my notes that where damages could be insufficient redress for, for example, a tort of nuisance, equity will grant an injunction to restrain further invasion of plaintiff's property. So let us say that somebody is always making noise at the back of your house. Or let us not say making noise. Someone is wearing pigs and chicken. Now, it's the, the place stinks. Because of the pigs and the chicken, the chicken noise will not make you sleep at night. The pig's death is just disturbing you, making you feel very uncomfortable. And then you went to court and the court gave you 10 million. What is the point of the 10 million era in damages? When that thing is still going to continue? What's the point? Therefore, you need what is known as an injunction. An injunction is an equitable relief that tells a party to do something or not to do something. So in this case, you are telling the party to not continue breeding pigs and rearing chicken. Do you understand? Because the noise of the chicken and the stench from the pigs are disturbing you. These are things that you would not find. The injunction is something you will not find under the common law. And then we get to the third one, which is the ancillary jurisdiction. The ancillary jurisdiction, also known as the equitable procedure. Now, the common law court had no power to order discovery of documents in the possession of a party to an action. The court of chancery, which is known as the equitable court, the court of chancery did make such orders, without which many wrongs would have been remediless. Another example of the maxim is equitable execution. At common law, a judgment creditor could not levy execution on any property of the judgment debtor in which the latter had only an equitable interest. Thus, for instance, an equity of redemption or a beneficiary interest in a trust could not be touched at common law. The Court of Chancery thus evolved a procedure whereby equitable execution could be levied on the equitable interest. This was done by the appointment of receiver of the equitable interest supplemented in appropriate cases by an injunction restraining the judgment debtor from disposing the interest. So when you are talking about ancillary jurisdiction, here you are talking about procedure. Do you understand? You are talking about procedure, the equitable procedure. The first thing that we discussed about in my notes is the fact that under the common law, where there are certain documents in the possession of a party, and those documents are as important for the other party to be able to make his case, there was nothing that you could use to compel that party who is in possession of those documents to give those documents to the other party. There was nothing. And you know that there is something under the law of evidence. That says that you don't get illegally obtained documents. If you get it illegally, then you cannot tender it in court. That is the section 14 of the Evidence Act. You know. So, however, there are certain exceptions to that, but that is the general rule. The same way there are exceptions to hearsay, but that is the general rule. Do you understand? So, where you cannot obtain it illegally, and you cannot collect it from the person because there is no procedure in court that mandates that person to give you the documents. How then do you make your case? But equity came to remedy this by creating a procedure by which you can do that. The second one is where a property, you have a case against the person. So you have Mr. A and Mr. B. Do you understand? Now, Mr. A won a case in court to collect 10 million naira from Mr. B. But the only property that Mr. B seems to possess, Mr. B has only an equitable interest on the property. Because Mr. B doesn't have a legal interest but an equitable interest, Mr. A cannot levy that execution of the judgment of 10 million naira against that property. Do you understand that? But that was under the common law. Now, the court of equity evolved a new procedure by which you can do that. So, 
because you can now appoint a receiver and all other things that the court of equity has done, you then can levy an execution of judgment where it is monetary on a particular property, even where the party, the other party in the suit, has only an equitable interest on that property, something that is near impossible under the common law. Now it is possible under the court of equity. Do you understand that? So we then move to our next slide, which talks about the limitation to the maxim. Now, the maxim must not be taken too widely. First, there are many wrongs which cannot be remedied in equity any more than at common law. Thus, for instance, unfair trade competition, which does not come within the definition of any tort, cannot be remedied either at law or in equity. Secondly, even where equity does provide a remedy, it may stop short of applying it in certain defined situations. For instance, although specific performance is a general remedy for breach of contract where damages would be inadequate, there are some instances where damages would not be adequate and yet specific performance would not be granted. Thus, Contract for personal service and contracts requiring the constant supervision of the court cannot be specifically enforced. It may thus be said that the application of the maxim is limited by what is realistic, practicable and convenient for the court. Now, this is what I was talking to you about in the beginning of the lecture, if you can remember, when I told you that it is subject, when you're talking about equity not suffering a wrong without a remedy, it is subject to the discretion of the court. The court has to look at whether or not it is realistic, whether or not it is practicable, and whether or not it is convenient before it begins to issue certain equitable relief. The court will not just come because you have come and given a very compelling argument or because you are a son or because you are whatever it is. The court will begin to dish out relief like his Father Christmas. No, the court has to look at whether or not it is practical, realistic and convenient for the court. Do you understand that? So with that, I gave example of spe specific performance where the court has to constantly, you know, supervise it. Then the court will not issue it because the court has a lot of cases. Do you understand what I'm saying? So with that, we've discussed about the limits of the maxim. And then thank you so much for watching to the end of this lecture. Make sure you subscribe, like, and share this video lecture with your friends who might need them. In my next lecture, I'll be talking about the second maxim, which is the fact that equity follows the law. Please don't forget to also follow me on LinkedIn at Dear Colala Daniels. And I hope that you have enjoyed this class. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to leave it in the comment section below. I would love to attend to your questions as soon as I see them. I will see you in my next class. Have a beautiful day.